Hello and welcome to Recap It. Today I'm going to tell you a story about a family discovers a violent act perpetrated upon the home's previous occupants. Let the movie begin. The movie opens as Will Attenton leaves his position at a bustling New York City publishing company, eager to dedicate himself to writing a novel and cherishing moments with his family. His colleagues bid him farewell with genuine happiness, expressing that they'll miss him dearly, as he was the finest editor they've ever known. Upon arriving home, Will is greeted by his joyful wife Libby, excited about the prospect of spending more time together. As they step inside, their children, Trish and Dee Dee, delight their father with a mural they've painted on the staircase wall, filling the home with joy. That night, after the children are tucked into bed, Libby inquires about the type of novels Will plans to write from home. He keeps the details a secret, hoping to surprise her. She thanks him for the flower she discovered on the porch that morning, though Will reveals he wasn't the one who left it. They speculate it might be from a secret admirer of Libby's, but decide not to dwell on it further. The following morning, while clearing snow from the yard, Will notices a man staring at him from across the street with a menacing glare. The man, Jack Patterson, is the ex-husband of a neighbor Anne, and is there to pick up his daughter Chloe. Jack's demeanor is cold and hostile, not only towards his ex-wife but also gives Will a mocking stare as he drives away. Back at his office, Jack receives a disappointing report on his financial statements, and reads an email casting doubt on the success of his child custody appeal, adding to his stress. Meanwhile, Will is working on his book when Dee Dee suddenly rushes in, terrified hiding under his desk. Trish explains that Dee Dee saw a man looming outside the window. Will investigates but finds no one there. He soothes his daughter, suggesting it might have been a trick of the light or a shadow. Suddenly, a tent on the roof collapses startling them, but they share a laugh over the scare. The following day, Will plans to fix his roof tent, but is startled to discover large footprints around his house, suggesting someone has been clandestinely observing his family. This discovery leaves him feeling uneasy and puzzled about who could have sent flowers recently. When Libby inquires if he's okay, Will dodges her question, instead complimenting her beauty and wishing she'd remain that way forever. That night, awakened by strange noises from the basement, Will stumbles upon a group of punks engaged in a seance. He reprimands them, and although they scatter, he manages to detain one girl. Upon questioning, they reveal their interest in the basement stems from a murder linked to the house's previous owner. Surprised by Will's ignorance of the case, they mention, he's back, leaving jubilantly, which only deepens Will's confusion. In the morning, Will approaches two police officers to learn about the murder linked to his home's former occupant. However, the officers are tight-lipped, sharing only that the unresolved case's prime suspect was the father, who survived being shot by his wife. They decline to share official records with Will, citing his lack of authorization and attempt to reassure him of the city's safety, which does little to alleviate his concerns. Will returns home to find his children terrified, clinging to their mother Libby. They overheard Chloe on a call loudly claiming that everyone in their house had been murdered, inciting fear in them. Will approaches Anne to discuss the alarming conversation. She promises to speak with her daughter, who has been troubled by nightmares. Will also inquires if Chloe had left flowers on his porch, but she denies it. He attempts to uncover details about the children mentioned in the basement, but Anne professes ignorance. As Will departs, Anne and Chloe watch him intently. That night, Libby awakens to find Will absent. She discovers him in the basement, clearing it of the ritualistic items. On the wall, she reads Peter Ward's Slaughterhouse and confronts Will about it. The revelation of the house's dark past sparks a heated argument. Will vows to make the home safe, trying to soothe Libby's fears. Looking outside, Libby notices a man spying on their home. Will attempts to confront him, but ends up injured near the riverbank, confirming Dee Dee's suspicions of being watched. The next day, their children are found playing in a hidden room behind a cupboard, bringing the family closer together. They uncover a storybook owned by Catherine Ward and a toy labeled with Beatrice's name, suggesting they belong to former residents, linking their present to the house's mysterious history. Following their discovery of an old film in their basement, Libby and Will uncover news detailing a sequence of events that had unfolded. A family was tragically shot in their backs. This revelation leads Will to learn about a suspect who was subsequently admitted to a mental institution. During this time, Anne arrives with food, offering apologies for earlier misunderstandings. Will informs Libby of Anne's presence, and although Libby promises to meet her shortly, she never does before Anne departs. Will later approaches Libby, inquiring why she avoided greeting Anne. In response, 
Libby wordlessly gestures towards the site of the shooting, now identifiable by bullet holes marking the walls, a grim discovery from their reading of old newspapers. They learn that the suspect, Peter Ward, was treated at Greenhaven Mental Hospital. Upon visiting the hospital, Will is asked to wait before meeting someone. It's then he notices Peter Ward's name listed under room 308. Stealthily, he enters the room, finding a photograph of his family that ignites his anger. Suddenly, he feels a touch from behind. Assuming it's Peter Ward, Will defensively warns him away from his family. The man clarifies he is not Peter Ward, presenting a discharge letter as proof of Ward's release from the facility. Returning home, Will reveals to Libby that Peter Ward is no longer at the hospital. The tension escalates when a car outside their home aggressively charges at Will before speeding off, leading him to suspect Peter Ward's involvement. Quickly, the police are on the scene, but Will's efforts to explain the situation fall on skeptical ears, leaving the couple bewildered and questioning the lack of police intervention. The following day, Will returns to Greenhaven Mental Hospital, seeking information about Peter Ward due to concerns for his family's safety. In his quest for answers, he encounters a man who presents him with video evidence of Peter's attempts to flee the hospital and track down his family's murderer. The footage also captures a visit from Anne, casting suspicion on her involvement in the matter. The video continues, revealing Peter's disbelief in being the real Peter Ward, responsible for his family's massacre. Preferring not to use his real name, Peter adopts new identities derived from his hospital ID. As the video plays on, it becomes evident that Peter Ward and Will share the same face. The officer explains that the man had been a patient for five years, adopting the name Will Attenton from his hospital ID. The letters W11 morphing into Will and the numbers 81010 into Attenton. Shocked by the revelation that he is in fact Peter Ward, Will attempts to contact his wife and exits the room, only to realize that the people from the story's outset were actually fellow patients. Confronted with the truth, Peter returns to his dilapidated home confronting the harsh reality that his family never existed beyond his hallucinations. <coughs> Lighting a candle, he urges his hallucinated family to accept their non-existence. Trish, Beatrice, Dee Dee, Catherine, and Libby Elizabeth Ward. Resist this reality. Stricken with fever, Peter collapses into sleep. Awakened later by Libby's call, finding his daughters suffering from fevers and mysterious gunshot wounds. Despite Libby's anger and denial of reality, Peter attempts to comfort her. Their moment is interrupted by the police who declare the house uninhabitable, likely following a report from someone. When Anne appears, Peter inquires if she made the report. Instead, she questions his memory of her and whether he sees his family. Through Peter's eyes, Libby remains by his side, unseen by Anne, leaving Peter entangled in his struggle between reality and hallucination. After the officers departed, Peter attempted to re-enter his house but was confronted by a figure emerging from the darkness, unrecognizable due to the lack of light. The stranger forcefully expelled Peter, accusing him of being a murderer responsible for his family's demise. The following day, Peter sought answers from Anne. Questioning her whereabouts during the incident, Anne revealed she was at home, with her daughter spending time with her father. Curious, Peter inquired why Anne had visited him in the asylum, to which she explained it was because of their neighborly connection. During their conversation, Chloe appeared, expressing her longing for Peter's family and disclosing that she was the one who had sent the flower to his house. This revelation helped Peter recognize Anne and Chloe as compassionate individuals who valued family deeply. Anne gives Peter the contact of Dr. Greeley, the compassionate professional who had looked after him at the hospital. In a meeting with Dr. Greeley, Peter explored the reasons behind his release. Dr. Greeley informed him that his discharge was due to the absence of conclusive evidence against him. Although she offered her support once more, Peter declined, fueled by a resolve to uncover the true killer behind his family's tragic end. As dusk falls, Peter makes his way home, eager to dive back into his vivid hallucinations. He presses Libby for details about the harrowing events of that night. Libby recounts hearing footsteps on the stairs, mistaking them for Peter's. She then recalls a sudden fall and the immediate pain that enveloped their children. Amidst this turmoil, Anne arrives at their doorstep, pleading with Peter to release the grip of his past and abandon the house. It's during this confrontation that Peter's memory flashes back to that fateful night. He had just arrived home, speaking to Libby over the phone, when a gunman appeared, aiming his weapon at Libby and their kids. Libby's plea for the gunman to disarm was in vain. From the other end of the line, 
Peter realized the peril inside his home. He dashed towards the danger, but the gunman fired indiscriminately. Libby, already down, attempted to retaliate, mistakenly shooting Peter instead. This revelation brings a twisted solace to Peter, understanding now that he wasn't responsible for his family's demise. Embraced by Anne, their moment of relief is shattered by the arrival of Jack, accompanied by the family's assailant. The attacker overpowers Peter, and both he and Anne are subdued with drugs. The motive unravels. Jack, intending to kill Anne for insurance and custody motives, had hired the hitman, who tragically targeted the wrong family. Frustrated by the error, Jack executes the hitman, then confines Peter and Anne to the basement, planning to eliminate them in a fiery ruse. In a spectral twist, Libby's presence seems to guide Peter, her spirit urging him awake. This spiritual intervention empowers Peter to overpower Jack, rescue Anne, and escape the inferno intended for them. Inside, a bizarre twist of fate sees the hitman still alive, setting Jack ablaze. In the aftermath, as Chloe embraces Anne, Peter re-enters the house for a final farewell to his family. Resolved to move forward, Peter pens Dream House, a memoir that cathartically channels his ordeal into a narrative that captivates the nation. Thanks for watching and see you next time.